YouTube fans. I'm here to show you how I took $20 and made an automated chicken door. You can see the big screen gated door here. It's made out of like dog fencing um, for a chicken coop. And that worked really well for many years. But eventually uh, the dogs were able to push the door open and we lost some chickens. I apologize for the late ones. So then I put in this ramp. Um, it's got a hinge on it, and we could uh, fold the ramp up, and I can demonstrate that, and that would keep the chickens from getting, or anything from getting in and out the chicken door. And that ramp just folds up like this, and we could tie it, it secured it, let it down, and then the animals could get in and out freely. And that worked out very well except sometimes you get stuck in traffic and you forget and life happens and you forget to close the door and that's what happened one night and a coyote pup made it through this hole which is approximately the size of dinner plate and uh, maybe a salad plate and coyote pup made it through there drug five chickens out the door um, killed one of them in there and, and, and consumed it and we had a yard full of feathers. So I decided something more permanent needed to be done, which is when I put in this door right here. And that door worked great for two months. Again, it was a morning and nighttime thing. Um, this is a piece of wire that I used on a screw, and I would pull it up and then hook this at the top. And that was how I kept this door open and closed. I didn't have to open the main door for the coop. I could leave that closed. I didn't have to worry about wearing out the, the latch I made or anything. Well, I'd always intended to make this an automated process. So, finally, I decided I was going to do that. And this is the uh, log that our rooster likes to crow on. Okay. So there's the nesting material. I just cleaned out the nesting box and I haven't refilled it yet. So you can see the door from the inside and the string on it and everything like that, right? So what I did was, this is just a piece of exterior plywood. This is how I made the door originally. And there's two pieces of three quarter inch aluminum. Doesn't matter the gauge thickness. This looks like it's maybe eighth of an inch. Used some uh, JB Weld, cleaned it up really well with a uh, little light sanding and then took some rubbing alcohol to get any fingerprints off these joints. So this makes a Z you can see here to hold this piece of three quarter inch exterior plywood in place so it can't be pushed in. Now it's really important because it drops below the bottom of the hole so nothing can get their paw underneath it and lift it. And then on the other side I just needed a backer keep it from getting pushed in and I didn't want to hog out the size of this beam and you'll see these wires and stuff here I'll explain that in a minute. So when I made this automated I simply used a string attached to a drill that is wound by a piece of rubber hose that is basically screwed onto nothing more than a three inch or four inch long deck screw and I can make this rope longer or shorter. You can see there's plenty of wraps on here. It's way too long. But I wanted to keep this dirt cheap using stuff I already had that I hadn't yet thrown away. And this drill had a failed battery. Um, this box was an old piece of toolbox. I, I kept some parts in. Um, the problem here in, in East Texas is it collects humidity and if any moisture gets in here, being a plastic box, it can't get out. So I decided to take all my tools out of keeping them in plastic boxes. Wood is fine because it can breathe and, and whatnot. So this is the control system. This wire right here is the feed from the solar panel. I'll show that. It's a black and white wire that came with it. And the black and white wire goes up the post, across the ceiling, keep the predator, birds of prey and predators out to that solar panel. It's a little 2 watt 12 volt solar panel is all it is. Came pre-assembled with all the wiring on it. I didn't have to do anything. So that's my power supply to keep my battery charged which is inside the control box. The drill, I took all the screws out of the drill. I had to remove the switch because this needs to go forward and backward and you can't use the switch to do that. It has to 
you have to move the wires. You have to change polarity on the wires. So I took it apart. I took some wires and I soldered them. Just an old piece of cord off of a power supply that had no longer functioned. Um, and I, I try not to keep junk around, but sometimes, you know, wire is nice to keep. And uh, this being a 9.6 volt drill, um, 12 volts would be more than enough to run it. And that comes down here and loops underneath. So this is a drip loop to keep water out. And then it connects up inside. The wires run all the way through and are directly soldered onto the motor terminals right there. Okay, so I take this apart, being careful not to get the gears all mucked up, and then solder the wire, run it out the bottom, put everything back together. Was not a big deal at all. Um, only took a few minutes. Uh, it took me longer than that to figure out the switch had to be removed. So, inside here are the controls. These two wires are just telephone wire. Uh, same as this right here. Um, this is like six or eight strand telephone cable that they used to use to run you know wires inside your house I had plenty of that left in the shop because the pocket gopher ate our telephone cable years ago and of course no one has wired telephone anymore anyway especially this far out for eighty dollars a month just buying a cell phone right so I took all that wiring out of the shop and decided you know what I, I've got very low current circuits inside this box um, this is very good cable it's solid copper if you bend it, it'll stay in a position, and that way, if there's a short circuit, it'll melt the copper right away, and um, this battery's got more than enough current to blow the copper right out, and then you no longer have a short circuit. So that's kind of a safety feature from my standpoint. And I'll open the box now. Now, you can see here that the door is currently closed, and this ambient light sensor wire is just, I just set the door shut. It's not supposed to be in here. It's supposed to run up here to the top and then measure ambient light so that the drill and the system knows when to open and close the door. The minute I open this door, or shortly thereafter, that drill is going to turn on and it's going to wind the string until this screw hits this connector and then it will open the circuit. Oops, it's not currently closed, so i got to adjust that. This has been somewhat of a learning experience here. Okay, so it'll wind up, it'll open this circuit, and then it'll stop running. And that's my automated switch to turn it off. Otherwise, the drill, of course, would just keep running and running and running and running and winding up your uh, string and break stuff. So here I'm going to open the door, and this should start right away. Ah! Boom. You hit the switch and everything was fine. So now I can show you my circuit box and here I have a little clip to hold this door open while I explain people um, what I'm doing. You can see that there. Here is the ambient light sensor. Um, it's nothing really fancy. I'll hold it against here. Just You can buy these anywhere. Uh, Mosier, um, Digikey, uh, and I put a couple layers of um, protected heat shrink over it to keep the moisture out. I don't think you would need to. And each one of these wires, and polarity doesn't matter, is soldered to one leg of this switch. Or, I'm sorry, sensor. It's a light sensor. Its resistance changes as the light level changes. So, let me put this out of the way here for a minute so it doesn't get interfere with our discussion and explanation. So those two wires come in here at the bottom, right here, come up here, and they go to this little piece of microelectronics. I don't remember what the number is, but essentially it's a transistor. And the wires go from the um, <laughs> EDC. Um, collector base and emitter is the technical term for it. So the collector on this one is the 12 volt side. And I have this resistor right here, which is a 100,000 ohm resistor. 
that resistor right there, and I apologize, I can't get a good picture of it, is essentially pre-charging the circuit to the base, which is the center leg of this uh, electronic device. It's essentially acting like nothing more than an electronic switch. It lets the very low voltage coming through on the blue and white wires right here turn on this relay. When this relay is on, it turns the whole system on. Okay, and the output is this green wire right here. And this green wire runs underneath here, way underneath. Not this green wire, it's a different green wire. Get that one out of the way. It's on underneath here, and it goes into the emitter, which is the third leg. So this takes this low voltage, low current, turns on this, powers up this side of the relay. This is ground side. All these relays are grounded together to the ground. Turns this relay on, which sets up these two relays. So these relays are the forward and reverse relays. You can look this up anywhere on Google. You can use two relays. Um, the center terminals are the ground, the, um, which terminals would that be? The uh, 87A are power, the 87 are ground, and the 30s are my feeds to the drill. Now you might ask yourself, well how did you know the drill was going to run the right direction when you connected it? What did you do? And basically I did nothing except leave this off. All I did was said, look it, I've got these two wires that run to my drill through this wire right here, this black and white wire. I have these two wires. If I need to switch directions to go up or down at the right time, all I need to do is flip these two wires back and forth. If it goes clockwise this way, it'll go counterclockwise if I flip them. So I knew that was just an easy thing I didn't have to worry about. Now you might ask what all this wiring is here for. It's just more of this telephone wire and these connectors I already had. And if you had to buy them, these are um, just the little uh, quarter inch uh, female spade terminals and then little ring terminals right here. Now this block is about two dollars if you had to buy it. I scrounged a fuse holder. Someone had one and I asked them what they were going to do with it. They were throwing it away so I grabbed it. This has a 15 amp fuse in it. Um, three is not enough. Five isn't enough. Seven and a half is unless the motor stalls and then it'll blow the seven and a half, few, half amp. I don't have any tens so I went with the 15. My idea is any of the wires in here will handle 15 amps for a very short period of time but they won't handle 16. Okay so the battery. I said I did this for twenty dollars. I was cost my solar panel. Here's my battery. My battery is a used RC battery that no longer has enough power to run a remote control car. It will get it to move, but it only lasts for about two or three minutes, and it's no good anymore. It is a 7.2 volt battery. Uh, my son gave it to me. He said, you know, instead of recycling it, so we recycled it for this. My power wire's here. It goes to the fuse. The fuse powers up this. This powers up my switch for a light on, light off, and it powers up all these relays. Every one of these relays is wired the same way. Okay. Then here is the white wire, which is the positive wire that comes in from my solar charger. Now, what you can't see very well is right in here, there is a diode with the silver band going towards the battery. And that's to prevent the battery from discharging by running a small amount of current through this charging circuit all night long. It's a diode. It doesn't have to be very big. It's a, it's a two watt solar panel, so a two watt diode would get it done. And these are my control circuits. These two circuits from relays, white and yellow, relay white, relay yellow, or as I named them in my wiring diagram, A and B, or C, B and C, go out to the white wire, which is right here, 
white wires on the bottom, and the yellow wire goes out through this cable, which I'm not using the red and black, you can see that. The yellow wire goes out, and that's the one on top. That goes to this right here. So that's the feed. The return is the blue and the green. The blue and the green then go to the respective yellow and white wire. So we have green to white and blue to yellow. Right? So we'll move down here. We have green to white and blue to yellow. Okay, you can see the blue and yellow. And they come up here to these other two so that way we keep the yellow and white and the yellow and white the same. And all they do is complete the power circuit to turn one of these relays on. So the reason I did this, because you wouldn't have to, the reason I did it this way is because I didn't have switches that I could use and just mount to where I could put a screw in here and turn it on and off, and I think I'll make that change. Um, but what will happen is if these relays stay powered up all the time, and you, you, you can't tell this obviously in a video, but they're all cold. They're not powered up right now. This is the power, and the blue is the ground here. If I interrupt this power, which is exactly what I did, I took the power from the yellow and interrupted it with the blue down here. I interrupted it with the blue. When this came open, it interrupted this contact right there. I'll show you. That's no longer connected. It interrupted that and it turned off this relay because these two are the on and off terminals of the relay. These are the power terminals. The ones in a straight line, the two parallels on the outside. You can see here. No, that's not focusing very well. I apologize. It's not focusing well at all. But suffice it to say that 85 and 86 are the outside terminals and they are what turn the relay on and off. So if I interrupt that power, I don't turn the, I don't leave the relay on all day or all night, which will save my battery. Okay, YouTube folks, that's how it works. So now at the end of the day, I'm going to show you, you've already seen it open, I'm going to unhook my door, I'm going to hold it with my hand, I'm going to take my light sensor, I'm going to put it inside here, Tuck it up inside so it doesn't short anything out. Just tuck it up inside, let the door close. And if I'm not touching, yep, I'm not touching. There you go. My light sensor comes out. There you go. It's all it takes. So it's not perfectly reliable yet, but I'll get it there. Okay, YouTube fans. That's how I took $20, basically the cost of a solar panel, and made an automated door for my chickens. Thank you. Please like and share if you think this has any value. Have a great day.